Our next speaker is uh, Professor Stuart J. Brown, Professor of Ecclesiastical History here in New College, and he will talk to us on Thomas Chalmers, the disruption of 1843, and the making of New College. Thank you, Jay. Such a pleasure to follow my friend and colleague, Professor Jane Dawson. And it reminds me just what a splendid lecturer she is. We could listen to her all day. Well, for my talk, we're going to move forward. Thomas Chalmers, The Disruption of 1843 and the Making of New College. The making of New College, which we celebrate today, is a result of the Great Depression, of the Great Disruption, <laughs> the Great Disruption of 1843. Before 1843, the large majority of the Scottish people, over two thirds, were adherents of the National Established Church of Scotland, the church by law established. But in May 1843, the National Established Church of Scotland was broken up in what was arguably the most important event of 19th century Scottish history. Over a third of the clergy and perhaps half the lay membership left the established church and formed themselves into the Free Church of Scotland. The outgoing ministers and laity included Scotland's most eminent religious leader and public intellectual, Thomas Chalmers, and the most ardent ministers of the Church of Scotland. Outgoing church members left parish churches that were often rich in memories, the churches where their families had worshiped for generations and where their ancestors were buried in the churchyards. Outgoing ministers gave up manses, secure incomes, and high social status. They all left for a principle which they believed to be more important than historic connections, incomes, and social status. But why was there a disruption? The story is extremely complex and has been the subject of weighty volumes. Many people at the time found the whole thing bewildering. Patronage, the Veto Act, non-intrusion, the first and second Octor Arter cases, interdicts, the Marnock intrusion, the Strathbogie Seven, claim of right, deed of demission. And for many today, the disruption seems but another division in the tempestuous history of Scottish Protestantism. But in the 1830s and 1840s, for all of its complexity, the disruption captured international attention and evoked international admiration and condemnation. An Indian Parsi from Bombay joined the Free Church in 1843, studied at New College, 1843 to 46, and he was commemorated in the famous disruption painting. One of our postgraduate students, Ray Burbank, is currently researching Bengali Free Church evangelists. The disruption was also important in the anti-slavery cause in the American South, as Professor Bond mentioned earlier. There is in the New College archives a set of earrings donated by a sympathetic black slave woman in the American South to the Free Church. What's the story behind that? And the escaped black American slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass 
came to Scotland for several months in 1846 to call on the Free Church to send back the donations it had received from Christians in the slaveholding states of the American South. The cartoon shows Douglas looking and saying, is this the Free Church? The disruption even played a major role in developing the science of photography. D.O. Hill and Robert Adamson photographed hundreds of people for the great disruption painting. And here, Hill has painted himself into the disruption painting with his camera. So why was there a disruption in 1843? The story, as I've mentioned, is complex, but the disruption had two main causes. First, there was the issue of lay patronage and the appointment of ministers to parish churches. Virtually every one of the approximately 1,000 parish churches in the established Church of Scotland had a patron, normally a major landowner or the crown, and the patron had the legal right to present or appoint the minister of the parish church. But most Scottish Presbyterians had believed since the Reformation that congregations, or at least their male representatives, should elect their ministers to ensure their acceptability to the community. And with growing notions of democracy in the early 19th century, opposition to patronage grew more strident. Patronage came to signify domination by a privileged and wealthy elite, a domination that was unacceptable in a church where all should be equal before God. In 1834, the Church of Scotland passed an act of ecclesiastical law to increase the popular voice in the selection of ministers. But the civil law courts ruled that the church could not restrict the right of patrons to present ministers. And this led to the second cause of the disruption, the state's assault on the church's spiritual independence. From the later 1830s, the civil courts began demanding that local presbyteries, ministers of local presbyteries, ordain patrons candidates to the ministry of parish churches, regardless of church law or the wishes of the congregations. And when presbyteries refused, the courts imposed heavy fines and threatened ministers with imprisonment. Now, ordination in a Presbyterian church is a spiritual act. So for the civil courts to force the church to ordain patrons candidates to Christ's ministry undermined the church's independence in spiritual matters. In late 1842, the church appealed to Parliament for legislative help with the claim of right. But Parliament refused the church's appeal. Why? Well, for many politicians, the opponents of patronage were viewed as dangerous radicals, Democrats and subversives, challenging state authority, property rights, and the social influence of the landowning classes. For such politicians, strengthened state control over the church was a means of controlling the population. As the state asserted its power over the Church of Scotland, many within the church believed, well, the church must bow to state authority. They held the most vital thing was to preserve the unity of the established church. And some, moreover, thought that aristocratic and crown patronage was a good thing, leading to the appointment of a superior class of ministers, learned and, and moderate men. However, 
many others in the church could not accept what they viewed as an assault on religious liberty. One of these was Thomas Chalmers, professor of divinity at the University of Edinburgh, eminent theologian, moral philosopher and economist. For Chalmers, the breakup of the National Church of Scotland would be a tragedy. But he could not abandon the principle of religious liberty or see the church become a form of social control. And so in May 1843, Chalmers led the secession of nearly half the membership out of the established church. It was arguably his presence, his international reputation, that ensured it would be a disruption, a breakup of the national church, and not simply a secession of a handful of radicals and malcontents as the government believed it would be. The mass departure was an impressive testimony to the principle that a church must be independent in its spiritual and moral witness. I'm proud of my country, said Francis Jeffrey, the eminent Scottish liberal politician, on learning of the disruption event and how many went out. There is not another country upon earth where such a deed could be done. And for many of the outgoing ministers and laity, believing as they did in the providential direction of the world, the disruption was not simply the breakup of the old order in church and state, it was also an opportunity to build something better. They would raise money and they would build a new national church with parish churches, schools, and even a university that would be independent of state control and promote religious and moral values for a more democratic era. And they would do so amid the worst economic depression of the 19th century. For in 1843, the British economy suffered a crisis, throwing tens of thousands out of work. Then from the autumn of 1845, potato blight brought years of famine to Ireland and the Scottish Highlands and Islands. This would be remembered as the hungry 40s. And the Free Church adherents made monumental efforts, and they created, through voluntary donations, a new national church within five years. Within five years, they erected or they purchased over 730 new places of worship spread throughout the country. They built over 400 manses, resident houses for ministers and their families. Through a sustentation fund, which Chalmers organized, wealthier churches subsidized churches in poorer areas. They also formed over 500 local primary schools. And by 1847, the Free Church was educating over 44,000 children. With one exception, every overseas missionary of the pre-disruption Church of Scotland joined the Free Church, and the Free Church took over their support and expanded their overseas missions. And amid this economic depression, they began an innovative urban mission at home. Based on a model that Thomas Chalmers had developed in the deprived Westport district of Edinburgh from 1844, which aimed at building communities, expanding education, improving social conditions for the working classes. The Free Church, moreover, provided more donations for famine relief in Scotland and Ireland than any other Scottish denomination. According to the eminent Scottish historian, Tom Devine, it was largely food aid from the Free Church that ensured there was no large scale starvation in Scotland in the later 1840s. 
Now there was, as we've seen, a darker side to these efforts. In 1844, the Free Church had accepted modest financial donations from Christians in the slaveholding states of the American South. It was only about 3,000 pounds, actually, and it was, this was widely and justly criticized. The Free Church was actually encountering widespread, considerable opposition in Scotland. For many in Scotland, especially landowners, the Free Church was an established, a challenge to the established order. A radical movement that needed to be crushed. Some landowners, such as Lord MacDonald on Sky, evicted Free Church families from their crofts, their small farms, or they dismissed Free Church laborers from their estates, hundreds. Many landowners refused to sell or lease sites for Free Churches, for Free Church churches or manses. And this was a particular problem when, as in the case of the Duke of Buccleuch, a single landowner held vast estates covering hundreds of square miles. In such districts, free church congregations were forced to worship for years, in some cases, outdoors, on public roads, or on seashores beyond the tide line. While their ministers often had to travel long distances to preach or provide pastoral care because no one on the estate was allowed to offer them even temporary accommodation. At least four free church ministers died as a result of exposure. Local authorities dismissed nearly 500 teachers for their free church beliefs. And in the towns, the free church was often mocked for its sometimes inexpensive wooden or corrugated iron churches in back closes. And this was the context in which the free church decided to do something bold. It would build a majestic new college in the center of Edinburgh. This would be a symbol of their determination to persevere against persecution and denunciations to become a permanent presence and help to shape a new Scotland through learning and faith. At this time, university professors who adhered to the Free Church were being threatened with dismissal. So if need be, the Free Church said it would form a free university, free of political pressures. In this, they were encouraged by the Scottish philosopher John Stuart Blackie, who in 1843 called on the Free Church to provide what he said would be an essential service to Scotland by erecting a free university in this country founded on the broad and deep principles of humanity and fraternity, a university with religion and, Christ and with Christianity, but without monopoly or state regulation. Now, the Free Church had set up a college for the training of ministers in the summer of 1843. There were initially four professors in a small library based on Professor David Welsh's personal book collection, and classes were held in, in rooms at 80 George Square, or 80 George Street, 80 George Street down by near St. Andrew's Church. Chalmers was appointed Chalmers was appointed principal and professor of theology of this college. And there was a desperate need for ministers because far more congregations had entered the free church than there were ministers. The first academic session 
opened in November of 1843 with 168 matriculated students. And during the next few years, this college steadily expanded. Chalmers had for many years been calling for major reforms in the theological education in the country, including the development of what he said should be five specialized departments, each with its own professor in systematic theology, practical theology and ethics, Old Testament, New Testament, and church history. He called for a defined curriculum in which there would be two years of study in each of the five departments. And he now sought to realize this academic ideal. The five professors were in place by 1844, and additional professors were appointed in, in moral philosophy, logic, and natural science. Chalmers also organized a new college missionary society getting students involved in visiting and providing assistance to the poor in the West Port, well, West Port and, and Grass Market districts of the city because he thought this should be a vital part of education as well, social service. And undaunted by the many obstacles, the opposition, they were, the, the economic depression, the free church also pressed forward with this idea of a great college building for their new college. An effective fundraiser, John McDonald, minister of Blair Gallery, managed to collect 10,000 pounds, a vast sum at this time. Some of it given in pennies from across Scotland. With this amount, the Free Church purchased a prime site on the mound in Edinburgh. And then some 20 wealthy donors, including Chalmers, gave another 21,000 pounds for the building. While the Free Church's Edinburgh High Church congregation, that is those who had departed and left St. Giles Church, they agreed to pay part of the building costs in return for sharing the building. And their former church now forms the part of the new college library. The college committee commissioned the Edinburgh architect and free church member, William Henry Playfair, to design the building. His plan was for a full university with three large quadrangles, each at a different level, rising up, rising up the mound towards Edinburgh Castle. The first quadrangle would be the public face of the building with neo-Gothic towers that would, when viewed from Hanover Street, frame exactly the tower of the Church of Scotland's new Victoria Hall, as it was then called, later the Tollbooth Church and now the Hub, that had been completed in 1845. Chalmers presided at the laying of the foundation stone on the 3rd of June, 1846, with a short address that formed a mission statement the college, he said, should seek to inspire students with the highest standards of scholarship and with a commitment to social service, especially among the poor, aimed at elevating the whole of society, the democratic intellect. The building, constructed then of a cream-colored sandstone, was completed in 1850. By now, the idea of a full university had been put aside, and only the first quadrangle would be completed. Chalmers himself did not see the completed building, for he died on the 31st of May, 1847, almost a year to the day of laying the foundation stone. The first academic session in the new college building commenced in November 1850, and to mark the occasion, each of the eight professors gave a public lecture. 
introducing their disciplines, their approaches, and the larger questions that they, in their field. The lectures were published in volume form and they reflected a, a commitment to serious scholarship and also to theology and religious studies as an ever-developing field. Never observe the professor of systematic theology while your minds are finite and God infinite will you exhaust theology. I like that. Never while your, fin your minds are finite and God infinite will you exhaust theology. And this, of course, opened the door to change in our curriculum over the years, including the introduction of religious studies and a study of the different religious traditions in the world. These opening lectures in November 1850 also established a tradition of beginning each academic session with an opening public le a lecture which continues to the present. There were by now, 1850, nearly 260 students matriculated in a new college, and it was the largest Protestant theological college in the English-speaking world. There was a library of over 13,000 volumes, including many rare books and manuscripts donated by individuals, churches, or other colleges. There was a natural history museum to support the teaching of science and religion. And in 1858-59, the assembly hall was added to the back of the new college quadrangle on property that was to have formed part of the planned university. Well, let me draw it to a close. By now, the passions of the disruption were cooling. And the British state was moving in an increasingly liberal direction. And it was no longer concerned with exercising authority over religious life. And in time, there would be reunion of the Scottish Presbyterian churches, and New College would, from 1935, become the Faculty of Divinity of the University of Edinburgh now the School of Divinity. And we'll hear more about the history of our new college. We've already heard from Professor Bond about Old Testament teaching here. But let me close with a word about our new college building. Our new college building, which rightly the anniversary we celebrate today. There is something deeply moving about our new college building, which has inspired generations of students and staff. As has been said of another university, the very stones do speak. Emerging out of sectarian strife, built against all odds, with the aid of thousands of donations, large and small, New College presides over the city of Edinburgh, raises the eyes of the city upwards, representing higher ideals of learning, humanity, and faith. And the building certainly made an impression on a young American, Chicago bred, who first came to New College in 1976. 130 years after the laying of the foundation stone and 45 years ago, to research the life of Thomas Chalmers and who then made it his home. 